For thousands of years, people have told stories about strange experiences that we cannot explain. Stories that conflict with our understanding of reality. Some of those stories found their way into print to be read by hundreds, thousands, or even millions of readers before being consigned to the oblivion of the archives. In this series, we dust off forgotten newspaper clippings, magazine articles, and letters from the library of the late Gary Mangiacopra, one of the most prolific collectors of strange stories in the world. Join us as we uncover the forgotten secrets of the archive. Box 3 of the Gary Mangiacopra archive is the most interesting of the boxes so far a large portion of it being newsletters and self-published periodicals to which Gary subscribed. These publications date to the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s, and are all on the subject of unexplained phenomena. They are filled with references to legendary wild men, lake monsters, and other cryptids that I've never heard of before. Some of these publications are extremely obscure and cannot be found anywhere on the internet, being absent from both digital forums and online marketplaces. Unfortunately, when I uploaded about a quarter of the files in Box 3 to the Archive website, I reached the maximum number of files that my web hosting provider allows me to create. If I want to keep adding to this archive, I will need to migrate my website to another host with a much bigger plan, which I frankly cannot afford to do at the moment. If you'd like to help me expand the archive with a one-time donation, or a recurring subscription with perks, please click the link on the upper blue banner of the website GaryMangiacoperArchive.com. Link in description. The first story we will explore in this piece tells of a springtime tradition in the Swiss Alps, commemorating an ancient genocide in which archaic humans are said to have slaughtered a tribe of mountain-dwelling wild men. Next, we will resurrect the forgotten story of a sea serpent, which terrorized the residents of a French island in the 1700s. After that, we will delve into the legend of the Huldefolk, the hidden people of Iceland, which have featured in other videos on this channel. Finally, we will take a look at the legend of the Ultimaha Ha, a monster said to haunt both the saltwater coasts and freshwater rivers of the American state of Georgia. Let's begin with Box 3, Folder 5, Item 1, which comprises the contents of the Autumn 2001 issue of the French-language magazine, Hominology and Cryptozoology. This magazine contains an article entitled Lochenthal, Le Génocide Helvétique des Paléanthropiens, or Lochenthal, The Helvetian Genocide of the Neanderthals, written by Eric Linoel. The following is a summary of Lenowell's essay, which describes a fascinating piece of cultural evidence for an ancient war fought between Switzerland's Celtic Helvetii people and a tribe of Eurasian Neanderthals. Enjoy. Lochentel is a secluded valley nestled between the Bernese Oberland and the canton of Valais in the Swiss Alps dotted with several small villages, situated between 1,200 and 2,700 meters above sea level. This valley is flanked by towering mountains, such as the Shinglehorn and Grosshorn on the Oberlin side, and the Willerhorn, Beitshorn, and Bertelshorn on the Valais side. Renowned for its timeless charm, Lochentel comes to life each spring with the famous Carnival, a unique local variation of the week-long carnival celebrated throughout the Christian world in Shrovetide the period immediately preceding Lent. This carnival commemorates an ancient legend of the massacre of a population of wild hairy beings by the first human settlers in the valley. Organized by the local youth, participants, usually male bachelors, dress up as wild men, wearing intricately carved wooden masks representing the Shagata, the legendary creatures of local tradition. These masks depict specific morphological features characteristic of legendary wild men the world over, including a low forehead, small deep-set eyes, a snub nose with wide nostrils, and large square teeth. The masks are dark-colored to mimic the hairy skin of the creatures they represent, with long hair flowing down to the shoulders. Participants cover their bodies and hands with burlap sacks to further enhance their resemblance to the legendary Shagata. From the day after Candlemas until Shrove Tuesday, participants prowl silently through the valley, carrying sticks and announcing their arrival with alpine bells. They delight in frightening children and chasing and playfully pinning down unsuspecting participants, often unmarried women, 
in the snow, reflecting the legendary predations of the Shigata. In his article, Lunowell speculates on the unknowable details of the ancient confrontation between the Lockintel Valley's first human inhabitants and some variety of wild men, which seems to have inspired this age-old tradition. Perhaps spurred by hunger, displaced from their previous abode by another tribe, or simply driven by a desire to explore, Lockintel's first human residents unwittingly wandered into the alpine territory of the Shigata. Perhaps frightened by these strange new invaders, the hairy inhabitants may have retreated into the mountains, while the humans encamped in the valley below. The latter likely possessed knowledge of fire, and wielded primitive weapons like spears, flint axes, and perhaps bows and arrows. It is clear that the situation escalated into conflict, although the exact reasons remain speculative. The most likely causes could have been competition for food, or aggressive behavior from the wild inhabitants towards the newcomers. Perhaps, as the prescribed behavior of the Lock and Tell Carnival participants seems to imply, the Shagata preyed on lone women and children, who strayed too far from their kinsmen. Whatever the case, the confrontation must have been intense. Lock and Tell tradition indicates that the wild men were physically robust creatures, well suited to their mountain environment, and capable of scaling cliffs inaccessible to humans. However, they lacked effective weapons, resorting to rudimentary branches or rocks. Facing them were less robust Homo sapiens, who communicated through speech and employed strategic thinking, wielded effective weapons like spears and flint axes capable of penetrating flesh and inflicting fatal wounds on vital organs. The humans likely had knowledge of rudimentary medicine, unlike the hairy beings. Moreover, they were almost certainly experienced in inter-clan warfare and could defend themselves against attacks. According to the research of Jordi Magrener, a Franco-Spanish cryptozoologist who would be murdered one year after the publication of this article in northern Pakistan by Islamic fundamentalists. The wild hairy beings of Alpine Eurasia are omnivores, which rely primarily on vegetation for sustenance. Their simple diet dispenses with the need for sophisticated hunting, farming, or trapping techniques. Humans, on the other hand, historically relied heavily on meat, which they procured by hunting forced to adopt a hunter-gatherer lifestyle by the frigid climate of the Pleistocene Epoch which made farming impossible. When two groups with different technological and cultural levels clash, the less advanced group tends to disappear. In Lockenthal, it seems that the disappearance of the hairy beings was violent and sudden, likely due to conflicts arising from the limitations of the space they shared with Homo sapiens. Although there is no way to confirm this hypothesis, it is at least affirmed by the cultural memory of the event which persists among the dwellers of this alpine valley. Future archaeological research could help uncover evidence of this genocide, such as skeletal remains bearing physical evidence of violence. Finding fossilized remains could also provide insights into the nature of the hairy creatures remembered as the Shagata. The tradition of the Lock and Tell Carnival persists to this day, suggesting that the ancient clash between humans and wild men left a lasting impact on the local culture. Professional carvers and sculptors craft masks for this carnival, some of which date back to the 17th century. Similar traditions exist in other Swiss Alpine valleys, which the article's author, Eric Le Noël, a resident of Montreux, Switzerland, fluent in German, planned to investigate. Box 3, Folder 5, Item 1 contains many more interesting stories, including a brief description of another Neanderthal massacre supposed to have taken place in the Outes Alpes district of southeastern France in the 1850s, in which 18 mountain-dwelling Cretans, said to be nocturnal, with a chalk-white complexion, were allegedly put to death and buried in a mass grave. Amid pieces on the ogre of the Loire Valley and the beast of Jouvedon is an article entitled Le Cheval Morin de Wesson, or The Seahorse of Ushant. This story tells of a water monster which preyed on the horses of a French island in the mid-1700s, the mortal remains of which are supposed to have reposed in a certain French museum for many years. The following is a summary of that article. Enjoy. Sometime in the 1990s, the author stumbled upon a peculiar story in an article in the West France newspaper about a remarkable event that occurred in 1748, which caused quite a stir in the gazettes of that area under the reign of Louis XV. In September 1748, during the equine mating season, a mysterious sea creature started attacking horses and other animals in the harbor surrounding the island of Wisson, off the tip of Brittany. 
Witnesses reported seeing a large, scaly beast with a long neck supporting a horse-like head, which terrorized domestic animals. Due to the creature's immense size, the peasant's conventional weapons proved ineffective against it. They sought permission for firearms, which were highly restricted and prohibited during that period, and were granted use of the firearms by the royal authorities. A group of hunters ambushed the creature and successfully shot it. Injured by the gunfire, the beast retreated to the sea and did not resurface. However, after a month had passed, reports of animal attacks resumed. To combat the threat, a pit lined with sharpened stakes was dug. A female donkey was placed as bait, her calls intended to lure the marine predator during the night. This time, the creature fell victim to the vengeance of the men from Wisson and was unable to escape. The creature impaled itself in the pit and was shot to death by hunters at close range who lay in wait nearby. Witness descriptions of the monster paint the picture of a prehistoric reptile evoking a carnivorous dinosaur with thick scaly skin, a head reminiscent of a horse, and jaws filled with sharp teeth. The animal was preserved and exhibited at the Brest Museum. It garnered significant attention from the media of the area with an English naturalist offering a substantial sum to acquire the body, but the offer was declined, and the body remained on display in Brest. Sketches and drawings were made, but over time the body disappeared, lost to the passage of time. However, the sketches remained in the Brest archives until 1944, when they were destroyed in Allied bombing raids that targeted the city's Museum of Natural History. The We Saw Monster is not the only creature of its kind spotted in the area. In the 20th century, several sea monster sightings were reported near the Channel Island of Jersey, in which witnesses observed one or two of these creatures swimming near the coast. The prow of the famous Drakkar, an elegant longship from which Norse Vikings ravaged the coasts and river settlements of Europe, is believed to be a stylized representation of these sea creatures, which would have fascinated the maritime Norse, who may have encountered similar creatures in their Nordic environment. Our next story is taken from Box 3, Folder 18, which contains 19 issues of the periodical Elswen, the quarterly publication of the Strange and Unusual Phenomena Research Association, formerly the Temporal Anomaly Research Association, which contains articles on all manner of Fortean subjects, from UFOs to time slips. In the tenth issue of this publication is the article, The Little People, The Hidden People of Iceland, written by the newsletter's editor, Mark R. Gardner of Oregon. The following is a summary of Gardner's piece on the legendary elves of Iceland. Enjoy. After graduating from high school, the author Mark Gardner had the opportunity to be an exchange student in Iceland. It was his first time leaving his home country, and he hadn't even traveled to neighboring Canada or Mexico before. Fortunately, he had met a girl from Iceland named Hjordis Magnusdottir during her exchange year at his high school. She taught him some essential Icelandic words and phrases before his departure, which proved to be incredibly helpful. One of the most intriguing aspects of Iceland is its language, which has changed very little since the time of the country's 9th century settlement by Norse Vikings. A modern Icelander can easily read his country's medieval sagas, dating back to the days of Eric the Red. In addition to their language, Icelanders have preserved many folk traditions from ancient Scandinavia, such as a belief in fairies, elves, giants, and trolls. While some Icelanders may deny their credence in the existence of supernatural beings, it's often only done in public or around strangers. Many locals maintain that elves reside in large rocks or the few trees found in remote areas, referring to them as Huldafolk, which means hidden people, or Alvar, which means elves. During a camping trip with his host family, Gardner came upon a steep hillside and found himself standing within a stone arch known as Elvar Kirkian, or the Elves Church. As he stood there, he experienced a strange sensation, feeling slightly dizzy, and wondered whether this natural anomaly might be one of the enchanted places he had heard whispered about by residents of this land of fire and ice. Garner notes that elves aren't exclusive to the legends of Iceland, but also appear in folklore traditions across Scandinavia, the British Isles, and the rest of Europe. Although belief in these creatures has waned in much of Europe, it endures in Iceland. While some locals speculate that the elves of Iceland are native to the island, others believe that they arrived with the earliest Viking settlers. Whatever the case, Icelandic people seem to coexist with these invisible beings more harmoniously than most other nations. 
Roads are known to curve around large stones believed to be inhabited by elves. Holdafolk dwellings are sometimes accounted for in the environmental impact reports. Farmers might leave portions of their field unplowed for the use of these mythical beings, and construction projects are often delayed to accommodate the local elves' residence preferences. While this may sound peculiar to some, it's a serious matter in Iceland. It's undeniable that Icelandic culture retains a degree of superstition. When construction projects commence in Iceland, builders and engineers often seek to determine if the area is already home to Hildefolk. Occasionally, however, surveys prove inaccurate. Small mishaps occur, with tools and equipment being moved or disappearing. In such cases, a psychic is discreetly called in to investigate and possibly establish contact with the elves. In 1989, during the construction of a new path in Reykjavik, equipment went missing, and computers malfunctioned. Renowned psychic Erla Steffen's daughter was consulted, and communicated with the local elf. Acting on her advice, the city rerouted the path to avoid disturbing two inhabited rocks at the site. In Kapavogr, the hometown of gardener's friend Svana Bogadotter, there's a street known as Elf Hill Road. At one point, this thoroughfare narrows to a single lane near a rock believed to be inhabited by elves. Attempts to widen the road in the past have been met with equipment failures and other minor incidents. Describing Iceland's landscape is challenging, unless you've experienced it firsthand. Much of the island is a desolate expanse of lava rock, moss, and lichen, dotted with active volcanoes, hot springs, geysers, roaring waterfalls, and glaciers. Some areas are so barren that they resemble deserts. The landscape is so uncanny that American Apollo astronauts trained there for their moon missions. Given this unique environment, it's not difficult to imagine a variety of otherworldly inhabitants populating the country. Besides feeling lightheaded at Elf's Church, Gardner occasionally sensed being watched, or glimpsed something strange in his peripheral vision. Although he often attributed it to feeling out of place, or his imagination running wild, he did not discount the possibility of truth in the Hildefolk tales of Iceland. Our final story comes from Box 3, Folder 12, Item 3, which is dedicated to a single article published in the September 1998 issue of the magazine Fate. This piece, namely Water Monster off the South Georgia coast by Frank Spaeth, tells the tale of the legendary Ultimaha Ha, a water monster from the state of Georgia, unique for its supposed adaptation to both fresh and salt water. The following is a summary of Spaeth's article. Enjoy. Off the coast of southern Georgia, there's something mysterious lurking in the waters. For decades, dozens of people have spotted a slender, snake-like creature surfacing in the Atlantic Ocean and the Altamaha River before slipping beneath the surface. Locals refer to this mysterious entity as the Altamaha Ha. The area's marshy landscape, dotted with numerous inlets and rivers, provides ample hiding spots for such a creature to go about its business without human interference. The author's informant, Ann Davis, an artist from Darien, Georgia, who had lived in the area for over 11 years at the time of the interview, shared her thoughts, suggesting that these creatures might be migratory, possibly coming to the area for breeding purposes. She noted that sightings seem to occur only at certain times of the year, and that there have been reports of smaller creatures. Davis recalled hearing about the Ultima Ha Ha shortly after moving to Darien. Initially, she found the stories intriguing, but didn't give them much thought. However, over time, she became more curious, especially after hearing similar accounts from other locals. The monster legend appealed to Davis's curiosity, prompting her to create a limited edition ceramic piece based on the creature, drawing her interpretation of the monster from the accounts she had heard. Later, she wrote a children's story featuring the Ultima Ha Ha, blending local history with elements of fantasy. Only after publishing her book did Davis begin to entertain the possibility of truth behind the Ultima Ha Ha legend. Feedback from credible sources who claimed to have encountered the creature, or who knew reliable witnesses, prompted her reconsideration. The apparent reluctance of these witnesses to discuss their experience in public for fear of ridicule added weight to the notion that the legend of the Georgian monster might actually have some truth to it. Davis speculated that tales of water monsters might have been brought from Scotland to Georgia, by Highland settlers familiar with the legendary monster of Loch Ness, eventually percolating into local culture. However, 
She notes that descriptions of the Altamahaha differ from those of its Scottish counterpart, imparting the image of a slender, serpentine creature rather than the plesiosaur-like monster supposed to lurk in Loch Ness. Davis suspects that there might be multiple Altamahahas, varying in size and occasionally agglomerating into groups. She suspects that many fishermen in the area may have encountered these creatures, but refrain from reporting their sightings due to fear of mockery. While many fishermen prefer to keep quiet about their encounters with the Altamahaha, the local newspaper, Darien News, isn't shy about reporting on the mysterious creature. The paper's editor, Kathleen Russell, has been covering stories about the area's monsters since the early 1980s. Russell's interest was piqued when reports surfaced of monster sightings in the Altamaha River, and soon everyone was talking about it, Russell explained. Her curiosity deepened when local fishermen verified recent reports with their own identical eyewitness descriptions. Despite spending her entire life in the Darien area, Russell herself has yet to catch a glimpse of the Altamaha. She may have come close, however, while boating with her husband in Doughboy Sound of the southern shores of Sapelo Island, the latter being a coastal isle just northwest of Darien. I spotted something creating a wake in the water, she recalled, but by the time we circled back, it had vanished. Darien News has published numerous reports of Altamaha sightings, some standing out as favorites for Russell. One memorable account came from the former mayor of Darien, who claimed to have seen the creature in Champney River, south of town. Another sighting occurred in 1980, when a fisherman reported encountering the creature at Smith Lake, 20 miles upriver from Darien. The Altamaha isn't confined to local lakes and rivers, sightings having been reported in other waterways in the American Southwest. Ann Davis mentioned similar creatures being sighted in Upper Florida, including Jacksonville and St. Augustine. There's a pattern emerging, although its significance remains unclear, Davis remarked. One unique aspect of the Altamaha is its presence in both fresh and salt water, making it distinct among water monsters. Russell recounted an incident from 1988 when a man named Harvey Blackman witnessed a massive wave and spotted a creature with a snake-like head and slick grayish-brown body at Two-Way Fish Camp, not far from the mare sighting. According to Davis, the most recent sighting of the Altamaha at the time of the interview was made in June 1998 by a group of boys who were hanging out on a family dock. One of the boys' mothers informed Davis that they were quite shaken by the sighting. Despite their usual self-assuredness, even the most confident among them was affected. One boy stuttered so badly while recounting the encounter that his mother initially couldn't understand him. Another boy remained reluctant to go back into the water. All they saw was about five feet of the creature's tail as it glided through the water, but it was enough to convince them to avoid another encounter. While both Russell and Davis believe the Altamaha to be a legitimate water creature, they remain open to other possibilities. Russell considered the notion that her recent sighting might have been caused by the wake of an alligator, although she doubts that alligators venture into saltwater Doughboy Sound. She also entertains the idea that it could be a large, undiscovered species of eel native to the area. I'm keeping an open mind, she remarked. So far, no one has been able to definitively identify the creature. Marine biologists from the Georgia Department of Natural Resources informed Russell that they have never encountered such a creature. Even the Smithsonian Museum, when contacted, admitted that they had never received a description of anything like it before, but suggested it was worth further investigation. On the other hand, some authorities, including the director of the University of Georgia's Museum of Natural History, dismissed the notion of the creature being anything out of the ordinary, proposing it might be an eel or an oarfish. Regardless of the differing opinions, the Altamaha continues to stir intrigue among Darien residents. Many are convinced that a water monster indeed lurks in the area. Until proven otherwise, this explanation remains as valid as any other for the mysterious creature known as the Ultimaha Ha. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help me expand the now stagnant Gary Mangia Copra archive, which must be migrated to a new web host, please check out the link in the description.